Good evening all. Can everyone hear me? Is the balance right? Can you still hear the tunes? Etc. Whoop whoop. Good evening. Lovely people. Let's get my face on screen for a minute, shall we? There we go. Hello. I've got this funky microphone that I still haven't really figured out yet. It's um, It's got these dials on the bottom that you can tweak for volume and another one that you can tweak for like, what balance you hear coming out of the speakers versus your own voice. So I kind of, I feel like I've got the balance a little bit wrong and I hear my own voice a little bit too much, which just makes it hard for me to know whether or not you guys can hear me correctly or not. So, so yes, good morning, good evening, good afternoon wherever you may be in your respective parts of the world. And for those uh, those fellow antipods this end of the planet, I hope you had a good Anzac Day. I went bouldering, which was awesome. But it wrecked my hands. You probably can't see it. But I've lost a lot of skin on the tips of my fingers and I ended up with... Ended up with I got bashed myself on the wall and I've got all kinds of injuries. On my, oh, it was great. It was great. This is what climbing is all about. It's great. Loved it. Hey, Peleus, how are you, man? Alpha Prime, Rasta, Bitwise, Mongo, Bitquark, Nemo Kitty, Archbishop, Atwolf. Thank you very much for joining in. It's lovely to have you here. <clears throat> so, I will. Uh, what I intend to do with each one of these streams is I'm not going to do a massive over the top dramatic intro. Hey, Food Poop. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of kick off from where we left off. Now, what I wanted to do first is um, is address a couple of questions that I had as a result of the last stream. So, from people who weren't able to pay attention um, along the way uh, because they were maybe on a different time zone and they have since watched the stream and the questions have come up. So, there's been a couple of those which we'll hit. Um, and so, we'll dive into that first and then I'm going to go and look at a couple of areas we've already discussed and maybe we'll dive a little bit deeper. There's a few things that I think are worthy of diving into just to give you guys a little bit more of an understanding. And from there, I don't know, maybe we'll wing it and we'll maybe go all the way down to the bottom of one particular thing, um, which will hopefully give some visibility of some of the inner workings that we're going to have to replicate. So that's a good question, Alpha Prime. Where is the T? The T is right here. Tonight is a loose leaf of sun from T2, nice and black. Um, it looks over-milked on camera, but it's actually not over-milked, I can assure you. So, cheers. Oh, yeah, that's good. Oh, and uh, someone asked me about chocolate. This is also important, because hacking without tea is definitely uncivilized. Hacking without chocolate, borderline, you know. Hey, cerealizing, how are you going, mate? So, I've decided that tonight we're going to have roasted almond dark chocolate. And hopefully my wife doesn't watch this stream because she doesn't realize that I've actually nicked it. This is her bar. Shh, don't tell anybody. She's probably going to watch this. And... Nah, she's not going to watch this. She hates watching my, my streams. Mm, so good. Okay. <clears throat> hey, Lucas. Mm. So good. Nice to see you on stream, Lucas. Thanks for joining in, mate. Right, right. So what I'm going to do, <laughs> feel free to contact Amy directly, Rasta. I'm sure she'll, um, I'm sure she'll appreciate you dobbing me in. Got to rinse that down now. All right, let's move on. Um, okay, so let's have a look. I think I've got, ah, actually before, um, before we dive into the question, um, the ones that I've got listed, I've just had a recent interaction with, um, uh, Jono Abroad, who I don't know whether he's on, on stream yet or not. Where are you, Jono? Abroad Jono, he is on stream. Fantastic. So, um, Jono asked uh, a question on Twitter earlier on today, just before the stream started. And I said that I was happy to dive into the answer a little bit on stream for those people who aren't necessarily familiar with Metasploit as a piece of software. So, that's a really fantastic thing to ask because I had made the assumption... There he is. I had made the assumption that um, everyone who was watching was a security person 
and hence they would know what Metasploit is and they would know what Meterpreter is and all that sort of stuff. So it's an unfair assumption because not only are people not necessarily security people, but um, not all security people really know how everything works either. So I'm just going to give a really high level overview of what Metasploit and Meterpreter are for those people who aren't familiar and maybe for those people down the track who watch this stream retroactively and have more of a development background in security, they'll be able to fully understand. So I might turn this down in my ears just a little bit. Push button, get shells. <laughs> That's the intent. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give a couple of definitions um, of what Metasploit is. So Metasploit is intended, in the words of the uh, immortal Egypt, James Lee over in Austin, Texas, Metasploit is actually a toolkit. Um, it's a collection of utilities that penetration testers should and could use um, to conduct offensive security style activities. And that includes reconnaissance, it includes um, pre-exploitation activities such as you know, discovering vulnerabilities, scanning, blah, blah, blah. It includes a bunch of modules that allow you to um, exploit the vulnerabilities that you may have discovered. And um, from there, once you've actually exploited the vulnerability and you've somehow gained access to the target system, if that's the exploit that you've decided to go with, then um, you can, from that point on, use that to pivot through into internal networks, do other post-exploitation activities, privilege escalation, that kind of stuff. Okay. So um, there are there are sort of two fundamental pieces of Metasploit at a high level. There is the, the Ruby code base, that is the Metasploit code base, and that actively runs on the attacker's machine. Um, and so they're all the modules that you can choose from there. That's where the database lives. That's where all of, that's where the attacker sort of interacts with the system. And then on the victim side, what you actually need is to have an agent of some description. Now, Metasploit supports so many different agents for one of a better expression, what I probably should say instead is payloads. So you can choose whether you want a standard shell, um, whether you want um, something a little bit more than a shell such as Meterpreter. There's there's VNC payloads, there's, there's all kinds of other stuff. But at the end of the day, most people, particularly when they're pen testing, will use either a shell or they will use Meterpreter. So Meterpreter is the rat or the remote access trojan or the agent or the whatever it is you want to call it that comes with Metasploit. And that is what you aim to deploy onto the victim's machine when you've managed to get, pardon me, when you manage to get code execution. So Metasploit runs locally on the attacker box. Meterpreter runs remotely on the victim's machine. That's effectively what it is. And as a result of that, Meterpreter needs to be able to run in a bunch of environments. It needs to be able to run in different technologies because the exploitation targets might be different. So if you pop a Java web application through a deserialization vulnerability, you'll need a Java Meterpreter, um, for example, depending on the vuln. <clears throat> you might pop a .NET web app. You might pop PHP web app. You might hit a Python web app. You might um, hit binaries, you might hit, like there's all kinds of different things that are living on remote machines. And when you execute the agent, obviously you want to make sure that the agent can run on that um, on that target technology. So that's why there are so many Meterpreter implementations. There's there's OSX, in fact, I'll say Metal. So there's a, this project called Metal that was kicked off by Brent Cook, who works at Rapid7, who is a legend. Um, and Metal was intended to sort of provide an implementation of Meterpreter that would run on stacks of different Nix style systems. Um, and that's that's come to life and has replaced the old Linux Meterpreter, which is awesome. Hey, Noel. Hey, Zorkat. Rahul, thank you for coming in. Oh, we've got questions. I'll come back to those questions in just a sec. Um, so that's effectively what it is. It is a client server application where the client is the victim and the server is the attacker. Okay, so once once um, you've actually got an agent running on a target machine, there has to be some form of communication between the two. There has to be a handshake, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Hey, Eric, thanks for coming in, buddy. Um, so, 
What was I going to say? So that, that is at a high level what it is. So Meterpreter is the native stuff that runs on the target. That's the stuff that gets gobbled by AV and you know all that sort of stuff. That's the thing we're trying to use to have running on the target so that we can do more interesting things than you could with a shell. Um, good evening, good evening. Thank you for coming in. So back to the question. Uh, Lucas, what happened to your finger? Ah, yes. So this is, um, this is an overuse climbing injury. That's all it is. So it's the same on this finger, but I'm not strapping it at the moment. But... This one is a little bit sore, so my, my hand specialist lady told me to strap it. So but it's all good. Thank you for asking. Too much coding? No, God, no. <laughs> hey there, man. Your live coding thing is very inspiring. I started contributing open source project, especially the Metasploit project. That's fantastic. Excellent. I'm really happy to hear that, Raul. Thanks for coming in, man. You keep up those contributions because that's what that's all about. And it's not only great for, uh, for the project, it's great for anyone who, um, who contributes because they learn stuff at the same time. A Jono, thank you. It's the thing that you get onto the target and can run other things. Yeah, yeah, you can tell it to do all kinds of crazy stuff like muck with webcams or you spin up a SOX proxy or do port forwards or do other forms of privilege escalation, run local exploits, gather stuff from Skype, pull creds out of memory, blah, blah, blah. So it's the toolkit that runs on the target that allows you to do sort of more interesting and fun stuff and troll people too. So that's effectively what Meterpa is, and that's what we're building. So we obviously have Metasploit already running, um, and that works. We're building another implementation of Meterpreter outside of the you know, Java, the Android one, the native Windows, all of the Linux ones that we've got, the Python one, the PHP one, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're building another one that can run inside a .NET context. Um, hands held up with the bouldering. <laughs> yes, yes. They, uh, they're a little bit tender, but, you know, worth all of the pain for sure. One of the key parts is get system, which is, oh God, I wonder if how many get system jokes we're going to have on stream by the time we've actually finished this thing. So um, it, part of me is inspired to go, you know what? I will accept one pull request and that's from somebody else who wants to implement get system in this thing because I'm fucked if I want to do it. <laughs> I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> Hi, AJ. It'd be great to see hard topics like PE, reflection, or the load assembly feature from Cobalt Strike. Yeah, well, we actually will we'll specifically be um, looking at the load assembly stuff from a .NET standpoint. Um, down the track, we will probably look at it from a native standpoint as well when we start talking about topics like process injection or migration. Migration in particular is where that's going to come up. So, yeah. <clears throat> Will I go through, and where are we? Man, people are talking, it's great, but I can't keep up. PE reflection, so reflective DLL injection, I guess, if that's what you're talking about, is, um, is something I've actually already talked about at a conference and the talk is up online. So if you want to hear me ramble about how reflective DLL injection actually works behind the scenes, then perhaps what I can do is provide a link to that talk um, in the notes in the GitHub repo. So if you want to go and learn about that, that you can. But given that we're not focusing on native interpreter here, we're looking to build a .NET one that may well be sort of beyond the scope. Lucas, thank you very much. There you go. So Lucas has just posted a link to the video where I talk about interpreters internals. Specifically, I, I talk about how interpreter gets running, what's involved. I think I even cover some TLV related stuff, um, that kind of thing. So yeah. But yes, we'll talk about name pipe impersonation and various other bits and pieces. So, but that's that's further down the track. Right now, our, our sort of first step in this whole development process, once we start coding, is to get an agent running. And by that, that means it spins up, it connects to or listens for a connection from um, Metasploit. And there's the initial handshake where Metasploit and Meterpreter go, yep, we're okay to talk to each other. And then we sit there awaiting commands from the user. That is effectively what we would deem to be a first step. And there's a lot of work involved before we even get there. Okay. So down the track, we will cover lots of really interesting things. But at the moment, what I really want to focus on is just the core of Meterpreter in a .NET environment and what that means. And when we start talking more about all the different versioning and, and whatnot, that's, you'll realize just how much is involved with this. Will this be totally different from a PS form? Yep, absolutely will be. That's the short answer to that question. Should implement get system, but it should actually get... <laughs> Shut up. Hate you guys. 
God damn it, never gonna live this down. Name pipe. Okay, last log says eight get system jokes so far. <laughs> God. We need to put like a stat, like a graph on the GitHub repo or something like that to make people happy. We try and break the record every time we stream. All right, Jono, I hope that's a, a good enough coverage, at least at a high level of what Meterpreter is and where it lives and all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, and if that isn't the case, let me know. If it is, we shall just move on. Yep, okay, no worries. So P, public enemy, not portable executable, the Windows cough format, Nexus, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's now flick away from my ugly face and let's move over to... Um, so let me just let me just bring this up. Let's go this. So what I'm bringing up now is oh, I'm gonna press the button. The button is that button there. Now hopefully that should. Oh, I've got another follower. Thank you, whoever that is. I can't see it on screen just yet. Um. Food, food. Oh, thanks, mate. Okay, so here are the two things that I've, um, I want to cover. So on the right-hand side, this, these are the notes that we had from the previous stream. So what I intend on doing is like building on to these notes for every stream so that we can sort of see how they've progressed over time. Um, and on the left-hand side here is just a, a few questions that, that I had received. Um, so we're going to hit these and then we're going to move on. Okay. Um, right, so the first question was from Smash, and Smash actually asked this question during last stream, but I said I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, and then I didn't actually get to it. Um, so let's answer this now. Are we going to be using NuGet? Now, who knows what NuGet is? There's got to be at least one .NET person here that knows the answer to that. Jono, maybe. Maybe Jono can answer that question. Um, the short answer for, for those people who don't know is that NuGet is like... Go on, Jono. Me almost. Come on, give us give us your version. This isn't just about me. I don't start until Monday. Package manager. Thank you. It's the stuff you get in some chocolate bar. <laughs> Packet manager. Packet manager. Close. Package manager. Thank you, Pelius. It's a package manager for .NET. Now, it's not a package manager for .NET. It is a package manager for applications written on the .NET platform which is a very picky but accurate difference. So inside, when NuGet first came about, actually it was this third party thing um, and there were tools and whatnot that wired it into Visual Studio. It's now actually a core part of Visual Studio. So if you use Visual Studio, you can use NuGet to um, say, you know what, I want to use JSON.NET for my JSON deserialization and serialization needs. So I go to the NuGet Packet Manager and I can say, right, now I want this and hit go and it basically just pulls the latest package down and wires in the correct version for the project that you're building and it becomes available as a reference and from there you can start interacting with it. So it's it's pretty cool. Um, it, it does a lot of cool stuff and there are a bucket load of NuGet packages out there for almost everything you deem possible and Microsoft themselves I think even push their own NuGet package, excuse me, up online. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool. So the reason why that question was asked, like why why would that be something that's worthy of discussion? Why are we going to use NuGet if we do, and why are we not if we don't? So herein lies one of the problems. All of the stuff that comes down on NuGet is third party. Okay, so that's the third party dependency. Probably we won't be able to use it unless the packages can be statically linked. Thank you, serializing me. That is accurate. So our problem is that for every NuGet package we pull down, that's a library. One or more DLLs that come down and sit on disk. Now, in a realistic scenario where we're building a production application for non-nefarious means, we can take all of those DLLs, shove them in a folder, and off they go. They'll live happily side by side on the file system, and they will all just work happily. Whereas we're not in that land. The land we're in is we've got a payload that we're pushing down the wire, and we can't assume that any of those dependencies are going to be sitting on the target machine, right? Lucas, I've used it for Entity Framework, which is a really nice way of doing DB work via code. Any framework code first. Yep, there you go. Entity Framework does indeed live on NuGet. I am personally not a huge fan of Entity Framework, um, but that is beyond the scope of this discussion. But each to their own. It's um, actually it's really good for 
you know, rapid proof of concepts and whatnot. But um, and I know it, it has got better over time, but it's certainly not my preference. And there's a bunch of security concerns that come with it that aren't typical. Um, but to each their own. Okay. So basically, what we would need to do for every package that we pulled down and depended on in NuGet, we would have to use some way of merging all of those assemblies into the final payload as part of the build process. So that could be using something like Fusion. It could be IL merge. And I think there's a bunch of them out there now. So I don't think that's a good idea. That's not a good idea for a number of reasons. Um, and the first first and primary one for me is like, it's gonna drastically improve this, imp sorry, improve, increase the size of the payload. And for the most part, we don't need them. So have a think about that for now. Null mode, you thought NuGet was chocolatey. Yeah, I thought you, that, that sort of implied that. So chocolatey behind the scenes makes use of NuGet, but chocolatey is itself a separate application. It's chocolatey is more like a um, apt get or a DNF style thing for Windows. So you can install apps like you would on a Linux box, but not really. Raster mouse, unless you combine with something like IO merge. Oh yeah, there you go. So Raster's already said exactly that. Um, so yeah, you need a tool to merge all that stuff in a single assembly, or you need to do something magical on the other side to make this work. Now, the problem is that when you add references, when you spin up the assembly, those references have to be there, be there. And by that, I mean, .NET has to be able to go, oh, you depend on that assembly, so I need to load that, and .NET needs to know how to find it. So unless you go through the extra step of making sure that when those binaries go down the wire with your original payload that they get wired in properly, it's not gonna work, which is a problem, right? So there we go, same as Brew. Yeah, chocolate is pretty, it's very similar to Brew, but it doesn't have, I think, the number of packages that Brew does. So is there an idea of a fat jar in C sharp. Oh, um, not in the same sense, no. There are tools out there that will let you do that kind of thing. But again, um, going back to my sort of key point here is I don't think we need it in any way. So if we think about the core bits that Meterpreter does, okay, now a lot of third, pack third party packages let you do things like, let's choose Entity Framework, which is an example that Lucas brought up. Entity Framework is a code first abstraction. So it allows you to say, right, over there is my database, okay? And please just go and generate a bunch of objects for me to talk to that database. So it analyzes the schema and it generates a bunch of objects behind the scenes, .NET objects that you can interact with. So that you can say, okay, I want, um, I want to select all the people out of my database. So you might go person dot, you know, fetch or whatever. I can't remember the exact syntax, but um, you use this, linky style fluenty sort of interface to say I want these entities to be pulled out of the database in this way with these relationships and, and whatnot. So um, it basically tightly binds your application's code to the schema that's running um, in the database. Okay, so that's one example. Now, Entity Framework is not actually necessary for you to be able to talk to a database. If we're using SQL Server in particular, all of this functionality exists in the core.NET framework, right? There are is it system .data .sql server or something along those lines. There is a core object that exists in .NET that already allows you to talk to a database. And so me as a bad guy who's looking to build a payload that can maybe talk to SQL server, well, I could add entity framework as a dependency, but that's not going to help me for two reasons. First of all, it's not giving me something that I don't already have in that I can use the SQL Server functionality that's already in the framework. But two, Entity Framework kind of needs to know about the database at compile time. Otherwise, it's useless to me. So that NuGet package, for example, would not be one that we would ever consider using in our .NET implementation of Meterpreter. So other really common ones, like I said, JSON serialization. There's... Um, uh, logging, there's interaction with other different types of systems, there's APIs to things like distributed systems, there's queuing functionality, there's there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there. So the question really is not are we going to be using NuGet, but more of a 
what third-party packages do we really need to depend on? Right now, I can't think of any. So you guys, if you have any concerns, hey, Caleb, Caleb Wum, Caleb Wum. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Thanks for coming in. Um, so yeah, have a think about it right now and go, okay, core.net functionality. What is it that's missing from that core functionality that I need to get a interpreter agent running? I don't need logging. We can do that manually. All we need to do is spit out stuff like um, system.diagnostics.debugger.print or something along those lines, right? And we can see things through debug view. So for the sake of our needs, we don't need to log. So, ah, oh, it's you gone, boss. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, does that mean? Yeah, that means you're not using a um, registered account, I assume. So that's fine. Thanks for coming in, man. Um, so, can anyone out there think about what a th what third party thing we would actually need in order to talk to Metasploit? Let's think about transports. I can make HTTP requests with core.NET functionality, so I can cover HTTP and HTTPS transports. Okay, so I don't need that. Uh, TCP, there are TCP socket clients. Nope, open SSL. Nope, yep, they do. So there's a whole cryptography library that was baked in from pretty much the start. So all of the crypto stuff works. Now have a think about this as well. Before you start throwing suggestions or more suggestions at me, what does PowerShell do? Does PowerShell have its own open SSL implementation? It is better than Java, I agree. So think about it, the PowerShell has to use HTTP. It has to do crypto. It does its own sort of custom handshaking behind the scenes, right? So Blexa, thanks for following me. So here's the thing. All of that stuff sits in the framework. We don't need to push anything custom down, right? PowerShell uses the stuff that's already on the target. That's exactly what we're gonna do. Because if you look at pretty much every stager that's written in PowerShell, you'll see system.net.webclient. You give it HTTPS, off it goes. That is a .NET object it's using. It's not a PowerShell object, it's a .NET object. So we're gonna use exactly the same thing. We'll be using those features to communicate back. Same with TCP clients. Um, there's UDP clients, there's SMB related stuff. So there's baked in object support for named pipes. All of that stuff is in there. So we don't need it for transports. We don't need it for serialization because we have a custom TLV packet thing. I am getting super excited. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm getting you super excited. Yeah, exactly, me too. I'm excited by this stuff, it's great. So think about it. What third-party dependencies do we need? We don't need any. We literally don't need any. This is why, um, you know, recently I tweeted, try to avoid using p invoke because the .NET framework is actually incredibly rich. It's richer than you possibly think. It's richer than I'm aware of. But what we should be doing when we're building our offensive applications in C Sharp or VB.NET or F Sharp or whatever it is that you feel you need to use that's targeting the CLR, make sure you look at the framework, go through the documentation, because I'm guaranteed in 99% of the cases there is a .NET object that will do it for you as part of the core framework. There goes my hopes of importing the NuGet <laughs> That's a really funny thing. That should should um should Meterpreter be a NuGet package? No, the answer to that is definitely not. <clears throat> not yes. It's um it's a no. We're not doing that. I will not um not handle any PRs that put fucking Meterpreter in a NuGet package. So does that make sense? So it's not just a case of oh do we need any package manager? I mean NuGet's the go-to one. The question is do we need third-party dependencies? Right now the answer is no. If we do. Think about this for a minute. If we do, chances are that it's for a specific thing that might be targeting, let's say, um, a, a third-party component that we just happen to know is running on the target at the time. And so to me, that's more of a post-module thing rather than a core interpreter thing. Yeah, does that make sense? So this is why it's important to sit back and go, okay, if we focus on what it is that we're trying to construct and we have a good knowledge of all of the concerns that we're actually trying to separate, then we can say, you know what? We don't need a package manager. We don't need NuGet. We don't need this. We don't need that. We just need to focus on this. And then Meterpreter becomes the glue between Metasploit and the thing that we're looking to actively exploit that may otherwise um, be 
uh, require having something like a NuGet package there so that Meterpreter itself can talk to it. Now, the, the SQL Server thing in particular is interesting to me because I would like to see down the track, when we've done a lot of the core work, I'd like us to build an extension, a specific extension that allows us to easily talk to um, MS SQL servers on the target. Now, Metasploit has post modules and various other things that allow you to execute queries on the target um, behind the scenes yeah, that, that are MS SQL servers. But it's clunky and it's a little bit messy and it's slow as. So what would be fantastic is to have an extension that really does provide a nice quality abstraction for you to say, right, I'm gonna conduct complex queries on that target over there. And behind the scenes be able to say, right, open a connection to the database and keep it open while I do all of these queries before closing. Whereas a post module would go, right, I need to execute this command to spin up a connection, do this query, gather the results, close the connection, send it back. Now, if we could streamline that process, if we could abstract more things like, you know, give us a stored proc to execute, give us the parameters, um, give us a bunch of other stuff that, that would make it so much easier for us to extract data or interact with a, with a target um, MS SQL server via Meterp. I think that would be really valuable. So maybe that's something that we can do down the track and all of that is baked into the framework. So the extension would literally be exposing more functionality that's already there. They're the best, right? <clears throat> What kind of protocols will the payload use? Will it have SMB so that it's easy to hide traffic? So again, if we think about our concerns, we have an agent running that needs to talk to something that we're controlling, such as Metasploit. Um, and so we need to support the transports that Metasploit supports. And Metasploit supports HTTP, HTTPS, TCP, to a point supports DNS. Um, I don't think it supports ICMP. But there is a notion of being able to pivot via SMB in the same way that Cobalt Strike does. Now, there is packet pivoting support, which allows you to do a reverse SMB connection where an existing interpreter agent is sitting there as a server receiving connections from other agents in the network and then passing that information back to Metasploit. There's also a bind named pipe payload, which currently allows you to spin up a named pipe server on the victim and then your pivot point connects to that. <clears throat> now, that's possible as well as I think um, Metasploit currently supports being able to talk directly to name pipes as well. Um, but realistically these days, unless you're on the inside, you're not going to have um, Metasploit running being able to connect directly to 445. So you tend to use that as a pivot more than anything else. So, yeah, there you go. It does, it does have that feature, yeah. So there are already SMB transports for Meterpreter payloads inside Metasploit, for those who didn't know. So I, I made one of them and there was another guy, I'm afraid I don't know his name, but credit goes to whoever that person is for putting the stages and payloads together that allow us to do bind named pipe um, payloads and connections. That's, that's really handy stuff. Mm. Ah, so good. Excuse me. Okay, so does that answer your question? Do we have any more questions about that sort of stuff? So what I'm gonna do is with these questions here, I'm gonna move them over here, right? Constraints, gotchas, and pitfalls. So it's not really a constraint. Um, actually, it's more of a specific consideration to, to .NET, NuGet. We don't need it because we probably don't need any third-party packages. Now that may change, right? That may change. Um, Jono, tonight is a straight black loose leaf Assam. Yep, quality, good stuff. It keeps me going during these streams. And we're already half an hour in. I've been talking for half an hour, I can't believe it. Okay, so that's the NuGet one out of the way. Now we've got a couple more interesting ones from um, Christian, Firefart. So, these were a bunch of notes that I got from a, a signal message from him. So. Forgive me, um, Christian, for just dumping this stuff on screen, but there are really good things to talk about, right? So, let's go through them. I'll read them out. I think the part where you need to agree on a minimum supported version will be the hardest to begin with as many .NET features will not be available if you target an older CLR like 2.0. Tasks, for example. 
Um, maybe it helps if we choose the supported OS before because that will already limit the versions. I think XP can be handled by older Meterpreter, for example. Maybe you can also say Meterpreter is only for Win 10, blah, blah, blah. So this would simplify development because you can make use of all of the new cool shit. That is absolutely spot on. But here's the thing. And this is one of the key, the key issues that we really need to talk about. And it's one that I'm a little bit scared of, but we just have to bash through. And that is, how do we support lots of different versions? Because I personally would like to support as low as possible. Um, but I don't know what that currently is. I'm thinking right now it's .NET 3.5. And I'll come to that rationalization just a little bit later on, right? So, um, the reason why this is an interesting question is because... You can um, you cannot assume that any particular version of .NET is going to be running on the target. A Windows 10 box, like Christian said, doesn't have .NET 2. Question is, if it's running 4.6, can it take a .NET 2 binary and run it? Don't know. Do you? Well, this is something that we need to figure out. I, I do know. I'm going to pretend that I don't. And we're going to figure it out live on stream so that we can all learn. So... What we want to know is, if we compiled a single binary, is there a way that we can take a single binary, a single Metserve DLL, with all the core features of what Metserve needs to support, and have that run on the target? I'm not pretending. You can pretend. Um, and have that run on the target, regardless of the CLR version. That's really the key question. Now... You don't think it will? I don't think it will either. Win 7 will be out of service from Jan 2020. Does this factor into it? Well, it kind of doesn't because, um, I mean, let's be fair, Windows XP still exists, right? And as fake bad guys, we don't want to go, oh, sorry, I can't deploy my interpreter agent because we don't support your operating system or your CLR version. So Win 7, right, it will be out of service next year. It will exist for a long time beyond that, I think. I really do. So we want to maximize the shelf life. The thing is with Windows 7 in particular is that even though it's pretty old, like by default it comes with a particular version that we can pretty much target regardless. Now, something that's really important to note here, okay? Business is still on XP everywhere. Exactly. Exactly that. So operating system versions will be prevalent all over the place um, and, you know, I still hit Windows 2000 boxes every now and then, which is really scary. So what we need to do is um, we need to understand as well the, the environment that we're actually looking to build the code in, and that is VizStudio, and what it means to compile C Sharp to a particular version of the CLR, right? So if we're targeting .NET 2 and we're using VizStudio 2017, is it using the same compiler? that was used in VizStudio 2010 or VizStudio 2008 back in the day? Is the compiler the same? No. So you can still target .NET 2 as a platform in Visual Studio 2017 and you can say, I want to still use these language features. So .NET 2, for example, didn't support um, Link, I don't think. Or maybe it did. Pick something that it didn't support. Um, it could be, there's a number of things that it didn't support. So if you target that framework version and the core object, the core functionality that you depend on doesn't exist, then it's going to fail. It's not going to run. However, the compilers are generally just syntactic sugar link. That's like 3.5 and up. I actually think yeah, you're right. I mean, .NET 2 was what had um, generics and whatnot in there. And for those people who are fanboys of F Sharp, Don Syme, the guy who built F Sharp, which I believe started as OCaml.net, and is an Australian from Toowoomba, absolute legend of a bloke. Um, I put him in the same vein as, as Joe Armstrong, one of the most humble, um, cruisy, magnificent human beings, just really razor sharp. Um, the dude is amazing. Anyway, that guy built most of the implementation of generics for .NET 2 just so that he could have it for his F-sharp implementation. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. So Don Syme, fucking legend. 
Um, anyway, so g- generics appeared in .NET 2, I believe. 3.5, I think, did come. Now, remember, 3.5 just comes with more objects, but still runs on CLR version 2, right? So you didn't get a runtime version of 3.5. You still ran on .NET 2. It just requires more objects. So 3.5 has extra bits that you can use. Yeah, I do love the guy. <laughs> he's, he's a good guy. Um, and he's an anti pot which helps. I think he's, he's, he lives over in um, the UK, though, working, working in the Microsoft Research Center in Cambridge. I think that's, that's where he is. Thank you, Lucas. I am actually going to open that up on stream in just a minute, um, probably, because we are, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But what I'm trying to do is, is not get lost in the weeds in that just now. What I want us to think about is um, the fact that the compiler and the thing that the, the thing we're targeting, that what we're compiling our code to, are not the same thing. So a lot of the new language features in C sharp we can use and still target .NET two, right? Because the compiler will take that syntactic sugar and convert it into something that .NET two will understand. That's pretty much what I'm talking about. But there are other things like Christian's alluded to here with tasks so tasks are objects right tasks are objects so behind the scenes if the task object doesn't exist in the runtime or the framework version that you're running under that's going to fail we can't use tasks okay that's what that means but there are still things in the language itself such as um i don't know i think i was going to use link as an example but things like using the var keyword um, rather than specify, instead of going string foo equals whatever, you can go var foo equals and give it a string, and the compiler goes, oh, I know that's a string. So little things like that where you can use more features of the IDE and the compiler to actually translate back down to old versions of the CLR. So we need to find the sweet spot. We want to find which version um, of the CLR we're going to target and then make use of as many language features that we can and object features that we can in order to do that sort of stuff. Now, if we look at tasks, now tasks are a really nice feature. They come with a bunch of really cool things, but at the end of the day, a task is just something that you kick off, you can run async, gives you some synchronization primitives, and you can chain things together. And like, actually, if if you look at some of the task function, I believe um, you can create a task and you can say, run it, and using some nice syntactic sugar, you can say task do a thing dot continue with and go and do this other thing. So you can say when you've done that job, I want you to then continue on with this other thing. And that again is all functional programming. I think it's, it, don't quote me on this, but I think someone said, oh, that's just a co-monad. I didn't say the word monad on stream. Okay, just saying. That. But all of these features and link in itself is, is very functional. So we're going to use some functional styles while we're writing our C-sharp code um, as well. So we don't, the thing is, my point is, we don't actually need tasks because we can just spin things up on separate threads. So as much as it might be nice to use tasks and they might objectify things in a really nice way for us and might make certain areas of code more readable, we can quite easily build our own tasks on top of threads. So there you go. Now... For uneducated plebs, can you give a quick, lol, being quick, shut up, of how .NET works in the sense of this CLR stuff you're talking about? What is the part that matters for compatibility of the systems? Do we need to worry about code syntax as we be dropping compiled things, or do we need to worry about raw code syntax due to stages, etc.? Okay, that's a pretty big question, right? Um, I'll try my best to summarize it um, so that we don't get lost in the weeds too much, but it is a really key point. So, um, .NET Framework is a set of libraries. It's that simple. They're a set of pre-written libraries that Microsoft have written to support um, the use of .NET on the on the targets. So that includes things like web clients and encryption and file system I/O and threading and all this other stuff. Okay. So they are the .NET framework as a set of libraries of things that you can use to... It's it's like the Win32 API abstracted into objects in many cases, all right? And other APIs too, such as the SQL Server one we've already alluded to, 
Um, but it lets you deal with a, so much stuff that lives in the Windows ecosystem. So registry objects are in there, for example. Okay, so all of those objects are part of the .NET framework. The CLR, the Common Language Runtime, is the implementation of a runtime that can take the code of those objects and interpret it on the fly and execute. Does that make sense? So the CLR is what's running. The .NET framework is the objects that support what, what you're running. And your own custom code runs in the CLR and makes use of those .NET objects. Is, is that effectively a high level summary? Does that, does that make sense? It is like the, like the Java runtime. So the Java JRE versus you know, all of the Java libraries that you get for free. That's exactly what the CLR and the .NET framework is. Now the CLR is um, Microsoft's implementation of a runtime that's, is it CLS? No, is an implementation of the CLI, the Common Language Infrastructure or something, um, which is a standard. And then when Mono first came about, Mono was an attempt to build an open source implementation of the CLI that would run on Linux because .NET didn't do that. Yeah, CLR is the underlying interpreter in the bytecode .NET libraries. Exactly. That's pretty much it, right? It's libraries versus not. So if the libraries are supported in that version of the CLR, then off we go. We can use those libraries on that version of the CLR. So for example, when I said um, .NET 3.5 came out, .NET 3.5 was just more libraries, but the CLR version didn't change. So they still use the same runtime. You just had a lot more objects in the .NET framework that you could use and the compiler changed so there were more language syntax features okay now obviously the compile side is a completely different beast all that matters when you're running on the target is the binary that you're sending down and what version is running on you could also implement a compile of any language that lang yes ex that's exactly right thank you um, you can target and sorry you can write any language that um, targets CLR so you could write in God knows what else. You could write F-sharp, you could write VB.net, you can write Boolang, you, there's, there's even like a lol code implementation for .NET. Now, as long as you're talking, this, talking to the um, running on the CLR, the beauty is too that you can write one DLL in C-sharp, one in VB.net, and then they can talk to each other. Why you would want to use VB.net is a little bit beyond me, but it is what it is. Um, Iron Python, Iron Ruby, Boolang. So, What's I think really worth highlighting before we get ahead of ourselves, and I'm glad you brought those up, Alpha. Um, Peleus, yep, you're welcome, dude. Is um, sometimes, such as in the case of F Sharp, there are other core libraries that are required in order for your F Sharp code to run. So there are some abstractions over collections. So, you know, lazy sequences and all these other bits and pieces that F Sharp relies on, and math libraries. And I mean, this may have all changed, um, but there are some core F-sharp fundamental libraries that need, needed to be deployed on a target before your F-sharp code could run. So that could be a third-party dependency. And that's part of the reason why we're not building it in F-sharp because we don't want to have to worry about those libraries appearing on the target. Now, there are also nuances between language versions. Um, the first one that comes to mind for me, and this has been the, the case from day dot, um, I don't know whether it still is. We can probably do some research on this too. But C Sharp supports the use of unsigned integers, but VB.NET does not. It, supp it supports signed integers, but not unsigned. So that means because VB.NET generates CLS compliant code, and that means it's code that can run on the CLR, CLI, any CLI, it means that the CLS standard doesn't say that you can use or expose unsigned integers. So if you generate an object in C-sharp that has an API or a function signature that includes unsigned integers, VB.NET can't talk to it, or at least it didn't back in the day. That may have changed. So does that make sense? Now the Iron Python and Iron Ruby, you actually need those runtimes in there. You need the Iron Python interpreter to be able to run Python code. Same with Iron Ruby. Fun fact, Iron Ruby was built, initially built, um, or I should say Ruby.net was initially built at QUT down in Brisbane. And I think a chunk of code made it from there into Iron Ruby along the way. 
So there you go. So yeah, you need those interpreters running. I mean, you can push them down and spin them up. I think um, ByteBleed has done a bunch of recent series of blog posts and tools and one that allow you to push down something like a, um, what's it called, Power Pick, which from there spins up an Iron Python interpreter, which allows you to then just arbitrarily run scripted code in Python, which is great. Um, why you, I personally wouldn't want to do that, but to each their own. So, you, you know, there's a lot of flexibility in there. Okay, does that does that cover that off enough? So, going back to this point, we need to think about how we're going to target different versions and whether or not we can build a single library that will work on all versions, which it won't. You can do some funky things with binding redirects and whatnot, which we can talk about later on, but that requires manifest files sitting on the file system alongside the binary that you're running, and there's complexities and whatnot around that, particularly given we're going to try to avoid writing this stuff to disk to begin with, right? So I want to start learning to code, but I don't know any jargon. Any recommendations? I want to make a simple Discord bot. Um, well, I can't speak for how difficult it would be for the Discord API to be consumed. I would suggest reading the documentation for that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess at the end of the day there, you just got to pick a language, decide to go and learn it, and then figure out how to use that language to, to do the bot-related stuff that you want. I'm sure there are plenty of bot examples out there that you can use. But that would be um, that'd be beyond the scope of this discussion. So I'm going to leave that question, and maybe you guys can talk about that in the chat without me being involved. Anyway, so we'll come back to this question because it's very key. And before we write any code, we pretty much need to know the answer. How are we going to support multiple versions? Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Can we add transport and protocol level encryption? <clears throat> actually, I should put a note. We have got a note, actually, haven't we? Um, which version do we support? So we're going to come back to this. All right. Can we add transport and protocol level encryption by default on the next implementation? Yes. Absolutely that. We will out of the box support TLD encryption. So handling of encryption of packets properly. That's already documented. This is something that we are not going to scrimp on. As part of our initial development, we will implement packet level encryption so that it happens on all of the transports. That is a non-negotiable as far as I'm concerned. So not even an option to disable encryption. Yes, I, I agree. <clears throat> now, we do, we do have to deal with some backwards compatibility issues here and there's an edge case just like there always is. There's an edge case and that comes around um, migration because what happens is you've got behind the scenes there's a configuration block which I mentioned in our previous stream and when we migrate we actually need to open a handle to a remote process. We need to copy a new payload over there and we need to give it a, let's say we're dealing with TCP comms, we need to give it a TCP handle which we can sort of copy across processes and then kill our version so that we can maintain the socket that we had opened in the previous process because we don't want to create another socket. Um, we could use HTTP which completely solves that problem but the point is we need to tell that target the thing that we're migrating into. We want to say hey these are all the transport mechanisms that we've got available. This is our session GUID. This is, this is all of the configuration for my current session. We want to copy that over to the new process too. Okay. Now, as part of that configuration block, you know what is not in there? An encryption key. And there's a very good reason why there's no encryption key in this, because if it's part of the configuration, that goes across the wire when Metasploit spins up an instance of Meterpreter and defenders can see it. So there's kind of no point from a, not, not no point, but there is less of a point doing that because from an OPSEC standpoint, um, EDR tools or other tools will just slowly evolve to be able to go, right, we know the encryption key is here, let's just decrypt all that on the fly and we're back to square one. So we don't push encryption keys into the configuration. What that then means though is in order to have the next implement the next instance of Meterpreter that's in the migrated target process talk to Metasploit is they have to renegotiate. They have to renegotiate a packet um, encryption key. So it, it basically functions exactly the same as what happens when you first start a new session. They do a handshake and they establish an encryption key. But in order to do that, 
you have to drop back to non-encrypted packets for that first stage. I hope that makes sense. Hands up if it doesn't. Hillbilly story time. Thank you for the follow. Um, very much appreciated. So yeah, we, we kind of, we do need to support at the moment the notion of being able to not have a packet encrypted. Um, and so if a packet comes in that's not encrypted, we should still parse it, we should still deal with it, we should still respond appropriately. Um, if we have encryption enabled on our side, we still encrypt stuff and we send stuff back encrypted. So if packet encryption is enabled in Meterpreter, it will always return an encrypted packet. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so that's more, more plural site and whatnot stuff. Hand up. Hand down. I don't know what that means. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when you migrate, couldn't you also pass along the current session encryption key? So that again, the, you sort of know the answer to that question already, Mongo, right? So yes, you could, but there are, t there are two things that you would need to do. Um, you would need to copy it into memory somewhere and say, hey, this is your encryption key. And in doing so, that's effectively stuff that goes cross-process that can be monitored. Um, so yes, you could do that. What makes sense is to push that into config because there's a lot of state that goes across in config and that config also comes from Metasploit. So there's a code reuse thing. The way that it's been implemented is to try and reduce what goes across the wire as part of config and from there, you just renegotiate the key. Now, to me, it actually makes a bit more sense to do that. Um, and if you think about it, when you're talking to MSF, there has to be at some point a level of trust. You need to say, when I'm talking to MSF, I'm gonna trust that that's it. So in the case of, um, of TCP, it's probably a little bit easier. Um, but at the end of the day, what we need to do is, um, for now, we still need to be able to support the notion of um, basically changing encryption keys. There's actually a benefit to being able to do this as well. Right? If you can renegotiate encryption keys on the fly, which we currently have the ability to do, we just don't do it, then behind the scenes, periodically, you could say, let's generate a new key for this next bit. Let's generate a new key for this next bit. And so they're constantly changing encryption keys. Right? Now have a think about this. But at the moment, we don't, we don't, on the Metasploit side, have really good accounting for sessions. Okay? See you, Lucas. Thanks for coming in, mate. Only unencrypted traffic is on startup. Once you have established comms, you can ignore unencrypted packets. Well, we can ignore them, but we don't. Any packets that come in that aren't encrypted, we still respond to them, but we always return encrypted packets, right? So if packet encryption is enabled, we always return an encrypted packet. Now, at both ends of the spectrum, both ends of the connection, there is the key that they're using, AES encryption key for encrypting and decrypting. Um, and so what happens though is like if your transport dies and you reconnect, what happens then? As far as Metasploit is concerned, currently that's a whole new session because our accounting isn't up to speed. We aren't able to say, hey, that one's actually come back. So we technically don't know because we don't know it's a session that we've already seen. We don't keep track of the encryption key. So we've got to renegotiate the encryption key at that time. Otherwise we can't continue, right? Otherwise we'll end up with packets coming in with an encryption key that we don't have, right? So, the beauty of this discussion is that this kind of highlights that we've got issues. We've got constraints on the current implementation that we have to cater for in ours. But the beautiful thing is that upfront, we will be supporting TLV packet encryption in the way that it needs to in order to be supported with Metasploit. From there, once this is done, maybe we can take a step back and go, you know what? We are going to implement pushing this across in configuration when we migrate. And then from there, you know, we'll have a different set of concerns to worry about. All right. Thank you for the follows, people. We are, I'm hearing the dings, but I'm not, I don't have it up on screen. So I don't know who you are. Shelf, shelf fail. Wow. Thank you very much. It's nice to see your name appear. And there's another ding. Man, I'm, I'm flattered. And I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the turnout tonight as well. Chuck 8 so that, that should hopefully answer that question. So the short answer is yes. And as Pellis has already implied, it's very unusual for me to, to give short answers. 
Will the stages also be .NET based or is there a plan to use old stages to load the new interpreter code? So let's go back up here and we'll talk about stages. Okay. Oh, I missed your follow. I'm so sorry. Make a system graph. Fuck, who is that? That sounds like it's Jeff. <laughs> 42 watching. Choco08, thanks for coming in, mate. I hope all is well in your neck of the woods. Things are all fantastic here. I've had my tea and I've got more chocolate, which I am going to eat in just a minute. <clears throat> now, um, so with state, we've got a whole world of, of fun stuff to do with stages, right? Lots and lots of things that we can do. Initially, what we're going to be doing is focusing on probably the most, most important slash easy ones um, to do. Caleb Worm, thank you for the follow. Awesome. Um, and that is, we're probably going to have an ASPX stager. So we're going to generate. Do we, do we have Tim Tams? No, I don't have any Tim Tams. Sorry. Maybe I should do a Tim Tam slam live on stream and give a hat tip to my um, my friend Brian over in Specter Ops who who, uh, who loves a good Tim Tam slam. Um, what was I? I keep losing losing focus because of chocolate and Tim Tams. It's my bad. Yeah. So we're going to generate what I believe to be the typical scenarios for stages. Now, stages can be executables, DLLs, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and we want to be able to generate C-sharp code. So code that can be shoved into a thing. Now, the reason why this is interesting in the case of ASPX files is like if you have a file upload vulnerability in an ASPX web app and you can push ASPX code up to the server and then invoke it, we need to be able to generate the C-sharp that um, allows us to, to do that. Um, that. It will actually kick off um, a call back to MSF and take a copy of MetServe and reflectively load it and blah, 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 all, all that sort of stuff. So initially stages will be .NET based. They will be .NET based. We'll be focusing on ASPX. We'll be focusing on generating C-sharp stuff. We'll be focusing on creating executables and creating DLLs. Now the XEs and DLLs are gonna be interesting. Um, we need to figure out how we're going to do that, whether we should use like a .NET template like we do with native templates in Windows land. So there's all kinds of things that we need to worry about there. So the answer to the question here is yes, we'll be using .NET based. We probably won't be using the old stages to learn to, to load new Meterp. And there's, there's a, I guess, an OPSEC reason for that and a complexity reason for that too. Because what we need to do in order to use the old stages with this new thing is we need to send down code or a library that knows how to reflectively or on the fly load an implementation of the CLR, then take a copy of the .NET version of MetServe and load that into the CLR. So there's an extra step. Like we need to transition from native code to .NET code. And we don't currently have the means to do that. Right? So that I think is complexity that maybe we'll target down the track, but for now, that's not gonna be part of scope. So maybe we should put something here um, as a sub point again. Won't be using the existing stages, or maybe we should put native stages. Um, we'll say it's too clomp complex for now. An input from an offensive DLR would be great. Okay, so the 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 DLR opens up a whole new world. I mean, the DLR. Is, I mean, I, I guess the DLR is the thing that supports Iron Python and Iron Ruby and whatever Iron related scripting bits and pieces. So yeah, that that is something that maybe we can think about down the track when it comes to extensions. So you could say, you know what, I want to use the Iron Python extension, and we get a um, we get a, an instance of an interpreter for Python etc. Um, all of those things are doable, but down the track. Um, if you, if we can come up with a way of saying, you know what, we, we can spin up a DLR and just give me an interpreter and we'll go from there, great. But for now, that's, that's the gold-plated version. We'll worry about that later. Should we think about obfuscating class names during compile time to beat simple pattern-based AVs? Okay, so to begin with, no. Down the track? Maybe. But to begin with, no. Um, I think that will add, right now, it'll add unnecessary complexity. 
And in the early days of development, we want everything to be obvious and visible and noisy so that we can figure out all of the issues that we may be having along the way. So that's a .NET specific consideration. Should we obfuscate, obfuscate at compile time? So I'm going to say not yet, which rhymes, which rhymes with .NET, not yet. But perhaps when we're done with V1, we'll look into it. Okay. So there's um, there's a, a difference. Jython and JRuby. Yeah, basically, Iron Python and Iron Ruby are sort of like Jython and JRuby on the CLR. Yep. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll worry about that down the track. And that's a valid concern. Um, for me... We're going to be we're going to be using debug compiles for all of our testing, and obviously, when we generate code that's going to be used in a real life scenario, we're going to we're going to spit out release binaries. And so maybe what we need to do is look at, at in release mode compilations we obfuscate, but in debug we don't. So we can we can think about that. They only run on the iron thread. <laughs> I like the metaphor. Okay, so that answers that. Um, I would love to see unit tests. Yes, yes, we did. We did kind of talk briefly um, about testing. Um, John O'Broad actually was the guy that mentioned that up. Um, and so, you know, we're not going to get quite to the point of property-based testing, but we will generate some unit tests that will allow us to do some validation of some of the code that we're writing. Okay, so major implementation is maybe this is worthy of its own. Testing, unit tests, integration tests, property-based tests, <laughs> as much as I would like it. I would say definitely have some integration tests and definitely have some standard unit tests as well. The, the perfect case, I think, for unit testing would be um, at least something like testing that TLV packet deserialization is actually going to work. Yeah, that was Byte Bleeder in the Silent Trinity framework. What was that one? Glaring issues the use of Iron DLR stuff is at. It's very easily signatured. Absolutely agreed. Absolutely agreed. Like I said, that's gold plated. Um, I'm not interested in dealing with the DLR related stuff now. Pay attention to this Vim usage, everyone. So <laughs> Love me some Vim, bro. Love me some Vim. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of options for unit testing. Um, we will go ahead and make use of that uh, at some point. Um, to validate at least a subset of what it is that we're doing is, is doing it correctly. Um, oh, by the way, test-driven development. I fucking hate it. So, here's a really interesting thing. Test-driven development, right? This is not... Um, most people think that this is about testing but it's more of a it's more of a, an approach to designing your software it's like a write the test first let it break um, and then try and fill in the gaps behind the scenes to make the test pass I find that quite abrasive in many cases um, it's down to personal preference is TDD better than not TDD I think that's subjective simple as that so I'm not a fan of doing TDD I'm just not so I won't be doing it Feel free to, you know, go and learn about that elsewhere, but I, I won't be covering off what TD is. It is a pain. Yes, thank you. Somebody else. Preach the choir serializing. Not a fan of TDD at all. But that doesn't mean to say it's bad. I just I just personally don't like using that approach to building software. Can you also think about some PowerShell wrapper that simply calls the interpreter DLL? Well, that's exactly what a PowerShell stager would do. In fact, did we even mention that here? We need a PowerShell stager. There you go. So a PowerShell stager really is no different. We already, if you have a look at the implementation of the PowerShell extension in the native Windows interpreter, you'll see that we have the ability right now to be able to load .NET assemblies directly into our PowerShell instance, our CLR instance, so that PowerShell can talk to them. That was PR'd a couple of years ago by yours truly. So we have the means to do that. And so having a PowerShell stager, be able to load a MetServe DLL, no problem. But would touch disk? Nope. Nope. Don't need to do that. 
For this way, you would have an easy PowerShell interpreter as it simply calls the native functions, but the PowerShell CLR mode will prevent that. See, we kind of don't need a PowerShell interpreter if we have a .NET interpreter because PowerShell uses .NET. So if we spin up PowerShell, we can give it a .NET stage and off it will go. So we just need to have a PowerShell stage. Does that make sense? How much of the code in this project will be common with existing interpreter code? Almost zero. It will be a full re-implementation of pretty much everything. So power pick to .NET assembly. Yeah, you know, that's pretty much what we currently do in the native interpreter. We do not need to do that. We don't need to do that at all. There are a number of ways to get a new assembly running without touching disk directly from memory and without using PowerPick, given that we will already have a version of the CLR running and in memory. So that's absolutely fine. Okay, and the last point here, .NET client profile or the full one, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter for us. So there are, I'll show you that um, when we open Visual Studio in a future stream, but you can target different framework versions and there's client profiles and non-client profiles. And basically it's like, you know, have you got the full fat version or have you got the, you know, skim milk version or the light or low fat version? Um, we will cover that in the stream where we actually really start focusing on versioning and what it is we know that we can and can't do. Okay, and we'll probably find that properly supporting all of the versions is gonna be one of the most interesting parts of this project. Last question, happy face. Go for it, food boob. I'm all yours. Oh, you don't have a question. We got to the last one and that makes you happy. <laughs> all right, sorry about that. Yep, my bad. Uh, oh, someone having a chat. I'll let that one go. I have some more to pile on. You do. Do you do? My experience is paying the case. Of oh, so you, you guys are bantering about TDD, yeah? Cool. Okay, well, I might let you go. Now, um, I'm not going to do a full two hours tonight, and let me tell you why, because today is a public holiday. It's Anzac Day. I've been away bouldering all day, um, and so I haven't been hanging around with, uh, with my much, much better half, Amy, and I would like to go and spend some time with her this evening. Um, and so I'm going to keep this one just a little bit shorter. So maybe another 20 minutes or so of, um, of this. And then we'll kick off again on Saturday for another couple of hours. Um, so, yeah, hopefully hopefully that's okay with you guys. But, um, you know, family is important and I love my missus. She's, she's the only person who fully understands me, which is kind of scary. And she absolutely deserves to have time spent with her because she's awesome. Um, so that's, that's, my, uh, that's my goal. Uh, Windows 10 specific, dealing with VBS, protected processes, doesn't really apply directly to project. Yep, that's correct. Yep, absolutely. What time Saturday? Good question. Um, I might do one during the day, but I'm not sure. I need to check the calendar and make sure that uh, I'm doing all of my parenting duties appropriately. So I will, um, I will let you guys know as soon as I know. Say hi to her from Twitch chat. I will pass that on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think what I'd like to do at this point, um, we've covered off all the questions. Um, we've covered off the high-level overview. We've talked a little bit more and we've added a little bit more to our bits and pieces here. So given that we've got sort of 15 or 20 minutes or so left to go, um, one thing that I think is, is probably something that's moderately low-level that we can talk about um, is the TLV packets. So if we talk about what a TLV packet looks like, um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Everyone wants to see the code. Um, I, I am deliberately focusing on talking about the issues up front and the, just so that everyone's aware of all of the things that we need to cater for. Because when we start coding, I am gonna be saying along the way, ah, but remember we've got this. Remember we talked about that back in this stream. We've got this concern, so we can't do that. So this is why we don't just bash code out because we end up writing code and we end up throwing so much of it away because it's wrong. <laughs> no, no, Alpha Prime, trust me. I love the coding bit too and I can't wait to get started on that. Like I really can't. It will be the most fun and collectively we will learn the most when we're actually implementing stuff. 
but this upfront phase is super important. And I want everyone to get in the habit of being able to go, you know what, I need to build a thing. Let's go through this process at least rudimentary. Rudimentarily, is that a word? Um, at least at a high level, just to get an idea. And then maybe we'll start thinking about what it would mean to do X, Y, and Z. Oh, yeah, but that clashes with these things. And so instead of writing code, you're actually getting a much better understanding of what it is that you're trying to solve, right? Um, this is development versus coding. Thank you, Peleus. That's exactly what it is. It is exactly that. Now, look, there is nothing wrong with smashing code out if you're prepared to chuck it away. There's nothing wrong with that. And herein lies a huge problem with doing proof, proofs of concept or proof of concepts is that um, they tend to turn in production systems. People just bash code out and go, yep, this is a thing that we know how to do. Um, and uh, look, it's a, here's a little bit of a POC. Okay, well, that POC is now production and that happens all the time. Step one, code. Step two, get it compiles. Shit, there you, there you go. Exactly that. So I'm trying to avoid that. Now, having said that, there are going to be cases where I will open up an IDE, fire up a new project, test some code, prove that something works, and delete the whole project, and then go over to our interpreter project and go, right, so we know that this is how we do it, and then we'll look at how we would properly implement that thing that we've just proved inside the constraints that we've got for our application. Profit. <laughs> um, okay, so... Let's have a quick look at this TLV protocol thing. Does um, has anyone actually? I know I talk about TLV related stuff um, in my talk that was linked earlier on. Do you guys want to go through this now, or is there something else? Bearing in mind we've got 15, 20 minutes, is there something you guys want me to talk about now? Let's have a vote. Put your hands up. Throw your suggestions in the chat, um, and we will. We will do, um, we'll do whatever you guys want to do. This isn't just about me. Any suggestions? I'd like to know more about how this TLV lark works. Yes. See, I think TLV is a good thing to, to have a think about. So maybe... TLV? TLV? Everyone wants TLV. TLV it is. So we hear the term TLV all the time in Metasploit land. Um, and TLV basically says, yeah, type length value. Type length value. So what that means is we are shipping information back and forth across the wire between Metasploit and Meterpreter. And every single packet that we send from Metasploit to Meterpreter is going to contain a bunch of stuff. It's going to have like a an identifier that says this is the unique identifier, like a correlation ID in some ways. Um, I want I'm going to send that identifier along with my command down to Meterpreter so that when the result comes back, I can say, ah, that was the result of this command. Okay, cool, no problem. All right? So we can correlate the um, the response with the request. Okay. Now, every command also has an identifier that identifies what kind of command it is, okay? And at the moment, as much as I hate to say it, that's a string. It's a string, which means that that's fingerprintable easily. Now, I don't know whether you guys remember, but a couple of years ago, as a, as a proof of concept, um, a couple of people wrote a host-based IDS that specifically targeted Meterpreter. And if it found Meterpreter code running, it would kill the process, right? And all it did was scan memory for strings that appear in Meterpreter, like standard API strings or core migrate or something like that. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but it basically scanned memory and said, hang on, there's a Meterpreter string in here that doesn't exist anywhere else. We need to kill that process. But that also meant that, you know, if you typed... Like if you opened up Vim and you typed that in and you sat there and waited, eventually your Vim window would get blown away because you typed a meterpreter string into Vim. Um, so that's pretty funny. You could also inject a meterpreter string into the process that the IDS was running in and it would kill itself. At least I uh, think it used to and then it checked for its own PID so it didn't kill itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. Um, so 
TLV packets, um, a TLV is a single piece of information that goes across the wire, okay? So that identifier that's the correlation ID, that'll have its own TLV. The identifier that represents the command that needs to be executed will have a TLV, okay? If you're invoking something like um, LS, you wanna say, give me a file listing right now in Meterpreter, you type LS C colon backslash temp, okay? then the command that you're sending will have, you know, I want you to do an LS, but there's a parameter that goes with that command. And that parameter is the path that you want to list the contents of, okay? That path is a TLV. It has its own type, it has its own length, and it has its own value, okay? Now in Meterpreter land, it's not actually a TLV, it's LTV. So the first four bytes of a TLV packet is the length, okay? So little Indian integer that represents the size of the TLV as a whole, including the four bytes, which is the length, okay? So it's actually the length of the thing plus eight bytes, which you have to cater for in the code, which drives me absolutely insane, right? So that's what that is. The second one is the type, the type of the thing. So that could be, it's a string. We know that it's a string or it's an integer or um, it's a group of TLVs, like a subgroup of TLVs, which we support in the protocol. Um, it could be a bunch of other things, but there are also specific defines for certain things. So you won't necessarily just go, oh, you know, it's a string. What happens if you have multiple strings as part of your overall TLP packet? Like you might say, um, I want you to go and resolve these three hosts. So for each one of those hosts, we need to go through and iterate over all of the strings that come through in the packet. But worse are cases where strings have different meaning. I want to log in using this username and password. Well, we need to differentiate which one's the username, which one's the password. So we give it an ID beyond, or I should say a type beyond just a string. We say, this is a username. And behind the scenes, we, we know that it is of type string, right? So that's basically how that works. So we have four bytes for the length, four bytes for the type, and then the content. And the content is obviously arbitrarily long depending on what the content is and we assume that the length value that we are given up front contains the the full amount so for a single single tlv okay we have the length that's the first part okay um now we know that this is oops i can't type four bytes okay so let's um let's make this just a little bit bigger this is not to scale Okay, four bytes for the length. Then we have the TLV type. Let's just put this in a code block so that my, uh, my Vim Markdown interpreter doesn't hate me. So we have the TLV type, okay, and that again is four bytes. Okay. And then we have the value, and that could be arbitrarily long. Okay, that value should match. So the length includes all of this. Okay. Um, okay, so you see that? This line here, the value of this length. So this value here maps to the entire packet size. So if you want to get this size here, you've got to subtract eight in order to know exactly how big it is. Does that make sense? So that's what a TLV packet is, okay? What are you guys talking about? <laughs> okay, it looks like there's a lot of banter going on right now, which I'm not gonna read. Oh, hang on. Lucas, metserve.dll. Um, I guess I assumed people would know what Metserve is. Metserve is the first DLL, like the core component of Meterpreter. It has all of the stuff that is required in order to kick things off. So that's transport, it's um, encryption, it's the ability to load libraries, um, it's the, the ability to do some other fundamental things. So if you think about a, a classic sort of Meterpreter, you need to be able to query um, the session ID, the current machine ID for identification purposes. 
um, we need to we need to be able to give it more libraries to load and for it to be able to handle extensions. And then from there, we can just keep giving it more and more and more code. But that, that thing is the initial agent and it's responsible for setting up communications and then being able to load more work. So that minimizes the initial payload um, while providing enough for us to be able to do more interesting things. Does that answer your question, Lucas? <clears throat> it should answer your question. It should answer your question. Okay. Um, all right, so that's effectively what a TLV, a single TLV looks like, right? A TLV packet basically is a um, L T can't type V like that. That's what a TLV packet looks like, okay? I mean, there's one way people use for looking at the interpreter presence. Some people, oh yeah, searching for the string. Yep, that's very true. Okay, so that's what a TLV packet looks like as far as the data is concerned. Um, but there's also a, a packet header. And this is where the really interesting stuff starts. And it varies, right? It varies. So, we're going to talk at, um, about what a packet header looks like um, from the perspective of a non-encrypted session first, okay? So this is what a packet header looks like to begin with, okay? Um, this is, there is a 4-byte XOR key. I don't know why I did that. Okay, 4 bytes for an XOR key. So... Even though we may have an encrypted packet or not, we obfuscate the packet by having a four byte XOR key and we basically just use that key to XOR over the top of the rest of the packets, okay? The uh, rest of the bytes in the packet, which basically means, and because we generate that XOR key on the fly pseudo randomly, what we see is every packet that gets generated, even if it contains exactly the same data, will look different on the wire. That's the point of that. It's about making things change, okay? That's pretty much what that is. <clears throat> All right, so we start off with an XOR key and this is there for every packet, whether it's encrypted or not, okay? Immediately after that, I believe, and I'm gonna to have to reference check myself in just a minute, we're going to have some metadata, which we'll cover in just a sec. That metadata, I think, okay, so I don't know which way around these are. I'm pretty sure I'll have these the right way around. Um, there's going to be a session GUID in here, and then there's going to be encryption flags. And then we're going to have um, TLV, I'll just say TLVs, right? TLVs. There's actually going to be, one sec, there's something else. There's a length value in here and there's a type value. So if you think that inside this, we've, we've kind of like the packet has a massive encapsulated length and type so that we know how big the packet is, right? Um, and so this this length here and this, tap, this type just here wraps up all of the other TLVs so that you know how big the packet is, okay? Does that make sense? Is that clear? Maybe I should do it like this to make it stand out just a little bit more. I know this representation isn't, isn't exactly obvious, okay? Um, so that's um, that's effectively what that is. Now I'm going to confirm because it's been a while since I've looked at this stuff. But the session GUID is a GUID, so that's 16 bytes, okay? That's how big a GUID is. The encryption flags, I believe, it might actually only be one byte for the encryption flags because we've got eight, by eight bits to play with there. And that basically says, um, it, if it's zero, then it's not encrypted. If it's one, it's AES encrypted. And then down the track, we're looking to possibly support different types of encryption. So, you know, if you, if you don't have an AES implementation on the target, then we'll return fucking triple des or, or something like that. So the idea is down the track to be able to support more encryption. Um, we may end up not using it at all, and it might just be a one or on or on off is is encryption enabled. 
Um, we don't know. And then here we've got four bytes, four bytes, and n bytes. Okay. Does that make sense? So that's what a non-encrypted packet header looks like. So bearing in mind that you know this this bit here that I'm highlighting is not technically part of the header, right? So how about we'll change this to non-encrypted packet looks like this, okay? Does that make sense? Dumb question coming. What was the drive or logic behind choosing TLV for OG Materp or even this project? So for the original Materp, I wasn't around for, the, for that decision. Um, so I honestly don't know. Um, I can find that out though. Maybe we should have like a, a guest appearance of Scape or Egypt on stream. That'd be cool. How cool would that be if we could get Scape or Egypt or HD or someone like that, someone in the know to come and sit on stream with us and uh, and answer that question. That'd be fucking cool. That would be cool, hey? Um, thank you, DeRaven. DeRaven for the follow. That's awesome. Yeah, how cool would that be? Yeah, let's let's let me let me hit the guys up behind the scenes. I'll track down the person who came up with that and we'll get them on and we'll have a bit of a chat. That that would be fun. Um, so we'll see how we go. Okay, so a non encrypted packet. Now to answer a really good question. Um, let's just do this. Um, no, this is what I need. And then... Okay, so... Does that answer your question? Who asked me that? That was... Someone talked about exoring. Dumb question. No, we already answered that one. What part is exored? Thank you. That was at Wolf. Okay, so... This bit here, so the XOR key, right? We know it's four bytes. Um, we then XOR, once we've got this key, we basically go, right, we know that we need another 17 bytes here, okay? So we read 17 bytes, and then with the XOR key, we basically unexor all of this stuff here so that we can analyze the session GUID and the encryption flags. Now I'll explain why we do that in just a minute. And then from here we go, okay, is the packet encrypted? Yes or no? And if it's not, we just read the rest of the packet based on this value and use the same XOR key to unexor. I'm not going to say decrypt or decode the rest of the packet. Okay? So everything from immediately after the XOR key is XORed with the first four bytes of that key. Okay? I hope that works. Pull them out of retirement for one last case. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, that's what a non-encrypted packet looks like. Oh, you've only just picked up on that. <laughs> I'm going to change that background along the way. Um, but uh, I just thought I'd leave it up for now. Does the output care if it's got nulls? Nope, it doesn't. It doesn't matter at all. Obviously, if you have a lot of nulls, then you'll see the XOR key repeated because XORing anything with zero is itself. So, if the session GUI is null, for example, your 16 null bytes, you'll see the XOR key repeated four times. Okay? And this is something that I am going to change. I'm going to change this so that this becomes a seed. A seed for a known implementation of a random number generator that's consistent across all of the um, platforms, including MSF, so that when you generate a different seed, um, you get you don't get the key repeated during your payload, you actually only see the results of the bytes that are generated as a result of using that seed. Does that make sense? So anyway, so that's what a non-encrypted packet looks like. This is what an encrypted packet looks like. So um, you've got the encryption flags, okay? Um, I'm gonna duplicate this. Um, what are we doing? We need to go clear that out. Encryption flags. Okay, so this this is where it changes just a little bit, right? So we still have this this thing here is what's encrypted. Okay, 
So when we use AES encryption, we end up with, if this encryption flag is set to one, we have the IV, which is the initialization vector. Um, maybe I'll call it init vec, right? Um, we also have a length. I should put the length in here too. So total, I don't know whether it's before or after. So I am going to cross check myself here. We're going to have the length. Um, we're going to have the initialization vector and then we're going to have the encrypted data. Okay. Right. So the encrypted data is basically this. So whatever the original length type and all of the other stuff. So looking back up here, the stuff that we had as part of a non-encrypted packet, this whole LTV, TLV section is encrypted with the AES key, which has already been negotiated. Okay. And then that whole encrypted block is prefixed with the initialization vector we use for the encryption and the length of the entire block so that we know how long the encrypted data should be because that's going to help us obviously um, down the track. Um, and so what happens is the XORing goes up to there, right? Does that make sense? Um, no, it goes, it goes all the way, sorry. It goes all, goes all the way out to here, okay? And so the process in order to decrypt this is we've got to DXOR all of this stuff to get to the encryption flags. And then we go, ah, oh, it's encrypted. So this length here, which is again, four bytes, the initialization vector is 16 bytes. And then obviously this is n bytes of encrypted data. So the whole thing is XORed again, whole thing from after the XOR key. So we have D XORed or XORed again to get all of this stuff here, get the flags and go, ah, we need to read the length um, and the initialization vector and the rest of the encrypted data. Um, and then we use the initialization vector in conjunction with the key that we already know to decrypt the data after we've XORed it all. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? I'm going to put this back. TLVs are just appended together. So that's basically what it looks like. I'm going to obviously drop this in the GitHub repo as well. Okay, so that's basically all a TLV is. So you can see that the process is that we can create a type length value and then we just serialize that. We just have one big long string of bytes. And then once we're finished with that, we've generated a packet. It could be full of results. It could be a request. It could be a response, blah, blah, blah. Um, we then take that. We encrypt it if we support encryption. We then XOR it and then we send that back down the wire, okay? Now, for some people who don't necessarily know why the session GUID is here, let me tell you why. This is because of packet pivoting. Think about this. If you've got Metasploit and you've got a Meterpreter instance, which is becoming a pivot point, right? It's, you're gonna set up a named pipe listener on this Meterpreter instance here. And then over here on this other machine, we're gonna spin up a reverse named pipe that connects to the middleman, okay? So the middleman needs to be able to go, ah, okay, so packets that are coming in from Metasploit to me, well, I need to know which ones are intended for my agent and which ones are intended for the agent that I'm pivoting to, yeah? So this is why, this is why the session GUID is in the header because the middleman meterpreter can go, oh, that's not for me and just ship it straight down to the instance of meterpreter that is mapped based on that session GUID. So it accounts for this stuff itself, right? Now on the reverse, this is important, remember, because behind the scenes, this also means that the man in the middle does not need to know about the encryption key. The encryption key is the endpoints. All it needs to be able to do is decode the session GUID, pass it on, right? Simple as that. So that's why the session GUID is in the header. It also means that on the flip side, when you get down the other end, when we do our accounting, we can associate the session GUID with an encryption key, and when the packets come in, we know how to decrypt. So. That's basically it. 
Okay. Line 22 should be encrypted packet. Sorry, did I not write? Thank you. There we go. How about that? Encrypted packet. And that, my friends, is an hour and 40 minutes. I've gone very slightly longer than I had intended. Um, so that, in short, is tonight's stream. Um, I hope that's useful. Like, the TLV stuff is actually really simple. The implementation is a little bit more of a pain in the butt, um, but we'll get to that. I've already done a version of this TLV parser in, pot, in um, sorry, PowerShell for the PowerShell extension. Oh, sorry, for the bindings in the PowerShell extension, but we don't actually need to worry about that. So... But uh, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. Um, as always, hit me up with questions. I'm more than happy to do all of the question answering rundown on the next stream because I want everyone to benefit from hearing the the answers. So um, please ping me. For those people who are, are really happy to get involved on Discord, there's already like 50 people in there, which is awesome. Um, please come along and have a chat during the day and drop your questions in the Discord channel and I will archive them so that everyone can experience them with us live on stream so um thanks for coming along like it was a really good turnout um love the discussion as always this is one, th one thing that i love about streaming is that so many people are talking um and you guys had a conversation all by yourselves without me involved which is fantastic um and you're sharing links to stuff and and all that sort of stuff so thank you much love to you all and um i will look forward to chatting to you again on saturday um so, yeah, I guess, thank you. All the best. Enjoy your nights. Happy Anzac Day. Catch you later.